Now, some people may have a whole different mission statement. My goal is to destroy my co-parent. Well, yeah, okay. And I've their, met those. Yes. And their objectives are right on point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to achieve that mission statement. Or yeah. some people is my goal is to get back at him for all the years of a horrible marriage. Mm -hmm. And if that's your goal, then you've probably got three really specific objectives that you're <laughs> going to do to exact revenge. Yeah. And a lot of times they, they, like you said, have wrong expectations about what we should be doing, right? We, we were divorced but we still need to be parenting together. And so when the other parent won't engage or parent the way I think they should, then I lose my peace because I'm trying to make the other parent do something yeah. I have no control over. Yeah. Hey, this is Diane Dirks. And I'm Rick Voiles. We've been working with co-parents in conflict for more than two decades. We've taught classes, written books, counseled parents, empathized, and agonized a few times to help people make sense of their complicated families. We were talking one day, and it occurred to us that helping the most difficult cases comes down to one simple concept. Is one parent willing to let go of the tug-of-war rope, or is it worth it to hold on and fight? So we invite you to take this journey with us each episode as we tackle the questions, should you hold on or let it go? Welcome to Co-Parent Dilemmas, where we give you practical solutions to those impossible co-parents. Hi, Diane. Hello, Rick. How are you? I'm good. good. How was your weekend? Um, my weekend was great. And I've got in two weeks, I'm very excited because for the last four or five years, every summer, I hold what is called Grammy camp. Grammy camp. Yeah. Yes. And now that my granddaughters are getting a little bit older, they're 10 and 12, I'm getting nervous thinking, how many more years are they going to actually indulge me with Grammy camp? <laughs> so. Well, you may end up with one of them for a little bit longer. <laughs> they seem to be very excited um, because they get to spend a whole week with Grammy away from mom and dad. Right. Mom and dad a chance to vacation a little bit too. And now that I'm at the beach, it's extra fun. Yeah. Anyway, I'm excited about that coming up. Sweet. Yay. Yes. What are you doing? Yes, yes. Beginning of summer. Anything fun? Well, we just had graduation my uh, from uh, pre-K. It's amazing how much they try to make that like a big graduation gowns and everything. Mortar boards and everything. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for five-year-olds. Uh, however, I must say they organized it incredibly well. I mean, you could expect chaos with a bunch of five-year-olds. or four Right. Year yeah. But no, they, they organized it incredibly well. So I was impressed with, with that. And it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Patreon. Okay. And our listeners have probably heard us advertise becoming a Patreon non-impossible VIP and what that means. Basically what it is, is you are supporting the show. It's $10 a month. And in return, you get some special perks. Mm -hmm. So recently, the most recent perk that I announced to our Patreon VIPs was being able to download a copy of my book, The Co-Parent Toolbox. It's a book that I wrote about 10 years ago, but it's still relevant. It's about sure. not, not necessarily high conflict co-parenting, but there are some elements in there. The, I talk about the weekly email protocol. I also talk about the grief process, anger management as you go through it, that kind of thing, for especially for people who are more new to divorce and separation. There's a little bit of something for everybody in there, but if if you become a Patreon in the next few weeks... Um, I think I'm going to cut it off the end of the first week of June. So by the time this airs, you will have uh, a week or two to sign on and become a Patreon VIP. And that will include getting a copy of my book. Um, cool. Also, another Patreon VIP perk is you get a link to our podcast index. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a spreadsheet that has all of our podcast episodes. And I've chosen four or five kind of category. So you can search that 
spreadsheet by categories if you're looking for a particular subject. So I think people have enjoyed that. And new to Patreon is being able to sign on for a year. And when you do that, you get a month free. Yes. So if you sign on today and sign up for a year's worth, it'll be discounted. So we've got a workshop that is, we're brewing right now that we will be <laughs> releasing soon. Um, probably will happen in the summertime. We haven't come up with a final date yet. But whenever we do workshops online, we give our Patreon VIPs a 25% discount. Yes. And we also have some swag on their, our website. <laughs> you can buy t-shirts and coffee cups and all kind of fun stuff. And we'll be introducing a discount code for our VIPs for that as yeah. well. So there's a lot of reasons to become a Patreon VIP for a small amount per month. Not only does it help us to be able to continue to do the show, because there are costs to us to produce this show. It allows us con to continue to do it, but it also offers you lots of benefits. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Perks. So, Perks for the favorite so do fans. That. Now, yep. How do you do that? You go to patreon.com slash CP Dilemmas. Uh, that's also a link in our show notes. So it's pretty easy. And uh, we hope that we'll get some more membership in that because it's also a community on the Patreon app. You can chat and talk with one another and find out who else is in a similar situation as you. And I think it's um, beneficial that way as well. Support. Absolutely. Yes, very good. So today, Rick, I'm going to talk about something that most people don't want to talk about. Okay. So why would I want to talk about it? <laughs> well, you do get some satisfaction in pushing those limits. <laughs> I know. Well, it's something called, and everybody close your ears while I say this, self-care. Oh, wow. <laughs> when uh -huh. you hear that phrase or that term, Rick, what do you think right away? Well, I uh, actually, the first feeling that comes to mind is guilt because <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> okay. not doing it. And why should I spend a lot of time thinking about something that makes me guilty? Uh, so, yeah, things. And, and then the second thing is all the excuses that I have to not not actually not actually do it. I could uh, self care for me would be uh, eating better and probably exercising more, uh, knowing that. Doesn't change anything. <laughs> so then Knowing I just that, go guilty. <laughs> it creates a lot more stress in your life just thinking it's, about it. Yeah, well, def defeats the purpose of self care. I think that's very common, actually, which is why I wanted to talk about it. And I want to talk about it from a more unique perspective than just, oh, you should exercise better, get more sleep, and eat well. Blah, uh -huh. blah, blah. Right? Yes. We all hear that. Some of us are better at doing it than others. True. But I want to talk about it, not just for parents, but also professionals. We have both audiences listening. Sure. And I think anytime you are in a difficult co-parent relationship or you're a professional working with difficult co-parents, it just creates a lot of not just stress, but questioning, self-doubt. There's always that sense of dread, I think, even for professionals. Am I doing the right thing for the children? Mm -hmm. Is this the right way to go for the kids? And I think with experience, you end up resolving that. I think you and I have come to a place of we feel pretty definitive about what co-parents need to do mm -hmm. to help their children. But it still can be pretty amazing. A narcissist or a psychopath can really kind of needle you to the point where you do start to wonder, am I wrong? And they right? You know, so the what I want to say to our co-parent listeners is I don't care how smart you are, how experienced you are, how savvy and wise and loving of your children you are you are always going to be susceptible to the manipulative gaslighting type person. Yeah. Because you think rationally and they don't. And the goal is to get you off of your rationale. Yes. Right. I posted recently on Facebook 
And I think that we have talked about the book, um, The Narcissistic Parent. Yeah, very good book. by uh, Dr. Childress, Guidebook for Legal Professionals Working with Families in High Conflict Divorce. Mm -hmm. And I posted a quote recently because I still think it's so very important. Um, And this, I think, is in the introduction of the book. He said, the following introductory primer on the narcissistic parent relies on descriptions of narcissistic pathology drawn directly from the professional literature to highlight the various features of the narcissistic parent's pathology their psychological control of the child, and the role reversal relationship that the narcissistic parent creates with the child in order to meet the emotional and psychological needs of the parent. Mm -hmm. And that goes against your very core, either as a non-impossible parent or a professional attempting to get a child what he or she needs in their parents. Yes. So the narcissist works really, really hard to turn that on its ear. And in that work, there can be some collateral damage, whether it's, I don't think it makes us quit, but it certainly wears away at our energy that you bring to the table quite naturally of wanting to be helpful or wanting to make a difference for your child. And a willingness to self-sacrifice for the benefit of that child, which is the exact opposite of what the the narcissist is thinking. They will sacrifice everybody around them. Right. Yeah. So talk about like polarized goals. Oh my gosh. Yes. And, And, you know, we talk about ourselves, but think about how that feels to the child to have two parents with such polarized goals. Different. Right. Which is right. Which is why we say, if you're the non-impossible, trust that because trust that your kids will see you as emotionally safe, Mm -hmm. but they don't always see that right away because the narcissist is so good at pretending to care, if that makes any sense. Right. They act, uh, well, they perform, especially in public. Yes. Um, Yep. Yeah. So given all of that. I think self-care takes on a little bit of a different meaning when we're talking about this kind of, um, this kind of stress or this kind of input into our lives. So I think for the professional, as well as for the co-parent, you have to manage expectations as part of self-care and understand what it truly means to make a difference. So for instance, for the professional in in the organization that I directed for many years, one of the things I always said to them, the people that worked for us on staff, no matter what you do, as long as we follow these policies that we've put in place, you will be helpful. We will always be helpful as long as we stick with our integrity and our values as professionals, because we will either really get someone into a different space, which is the ultimate goal, right? Mm -hmm. That you get two co-parents to do different things or to think of things differently and they begin to interact in a way that benefits their children. That's the icing on the cake. But if you go into this work always expecting that, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Yes. So what I'm hearing you say is in the mediation world, we talk a lot about self-determination that they, uh, when I taught mediation, it was, you know, the parties have a right to be stupid. Um, Right. I, I can't, and I need to respect that right. So I don't have control, but I do have influence, yeah. but I need to, like you say, manage my expectations. And I think it's easier too, if you have a process that you feel is good for the family and good for the kids and you work the process. So just like in mediation, (laughs) success for you depends on whether or not you work the process. Right. It doesn't necessarily equate to the kind of outcome you hope to have with the couples. Like you said, in mediation, somebody might say, I don't care how much you try to mediate with this. I feel like I need my day in court and they're going to get their day in court, whether you are a good mediator or not. Right. So the first level of expectation 
or let's say first level of success would be that parents actually learn something from you and they do better. The second level of success is about helping one parent. Yes. Much like we do on this podcast. You mm-hmm. know, we assume the impossible parents aren't listening. Mm-hmm. But if we didn't believe that the non-impossible parent could actually change the trajectory of their co-parent relationship and therefore help their children, we would not be doing this podcast. Yes. Right? Uh, Absolutely. So if you can't help both parents, there's great hope in helping one parent. Yeah. Because if one parent gets it, one parent understands what's most important to the children. Mm Mm-hmm then there's a high probability that that parent will not only experience a sense of peace, but so will their children. Yeah, indeed. Yep. So I can't really say what the percentages are. We could sort of make them up in our head. Rick, over the years, would you say out of all the people that co-parents that we've worked with, maybe 20% fit in the first category of we actually taught them something and they learned differently and became better overall because of working with us as professionals. You mean 20% where both parents learn something? Yes. I would probably go a little lower. So that's even that, high. That's That yeah. would be ambitious. Yeah. So any professional getting into this work, if you're told, well, you can do this work, but 80% of the time you'll fail. Yes. Why would you do this work? <laughs> Right. Yeah, that that the that, that leads to drinking. <laughs> so. Right. so you have to manage the expectations that you're probably not going to get that 10 to 20 percent where you actually help both parents. What percentage would you say that when we work with parents, we help one? That would be I I would say a higher a lot higher number. A much I higher. would, yeah, I would say somewhere between fifty and seventy-five percent. Yeah, I would. I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking around sixty percent, seventy percent, and that's a beautiful thing. Oh yeah. So if you put those together, you could be looking at eighty-five percent success. Yeah, right? optimistically, yeah, that would be the high number. If you, I think, if you yeah. say to yourself, I might not be able to help everybody, but I might be able to help one half of the co-parent couple mm-hmm. to instigate some important change. Uh, and keep in mind, when we get court ordered to work with somebody, we're already dealing with the bottom 20%. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yes. So again, by virtue of them being court ordered to somebody like us, The court has already determined the chances of success are pretty low. And then we're taking we're taking the bottom of the barrel and saying, okay, okay, can we bump them up somehow to be in the top 50%? You know. Yes. Um, the final piece of success would be you don't help both parents. Maybe you have trouble even helping one of the parents, but the beauty of being in a court ordered process is that you can then tell the court what you learned. Yes. We can influence the decision-making process of the courts that might help. Right. Bring peace or help the children. Yeah. And I I always said to couples when I would start working with them, you know, we only did work that was non-confidential, right? That's why a lot of people Mm -hmm. get frustrated by co-parent counseling because oftentimes the co-parent counselor's contract states that it's a confidential process. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you the success rate for that is virtually zero. Yes. Unless they're um, low to medium conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because a confidential process really requires uh, self-motivation and two people that really want the process to work. But mm-hmm. by the time you get to somebody having to be court ordered to a process like that, to <laughs> court order someone to a confidential process probably has zero chance of success because the narcissist is going to co-op that process because they know you can't tattle on them. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So I want to say that to the professionals out there that be careful about the types of parents you work with in a confidential process. Because there's not really any leverage. There's no teeth. 
And I used to say to people, I have the power to report against you or testify against you in court. It's the last thing I want to do. Yeah. Don't want to wield that power. I just don't. Yes. So the, you know, so we're either going to help both parents. We're going to help one parent or we're going to tell on them. (laughs) (laughs) So there's, there's really no chance for failure in that. True. Even if people quit the process, but you're court ordered, you still get to tell. Right. Yeah. So how does that all relate to self-care? Well, one of the ways to manage your stress as a professional and working with these cases is to manage expectations. Mm -hmm. Like I just said, I will be successful in one of these three ways. I'll start with number one and then we'll move to two and then we'll move to three. If we have to, don't want to move to three, but you know, we'll do the process and see where the process leads us with this particular couple. If you approach it that way, this should not be a extremely uh, stressful process Mm -hmm. does not mean the people involved won't drive you crazy. (laughs) Right. Which is where the real self-care comes in. Does that make sense? That's interesting. I think you you're saying that just because I need self-care or just because I am need to do a little extra self-care because I'm incredibly stressed doesn't mean I'm not succeeding. That's part of it. I think maybe I'm mixing things up here. Let's say I'm a professional and I'm feeling extra stressed. And I don't really know why, other than I work with these crazy co-parents. Yeah. Well, if you just think exercise and eating better and sleeping better are going to fix that, or maybe I need to take an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety, you're treating the symptom when really maybe the problem lies in the fact that, that you're not, you don't have a good process in place to do your work. You're not confident in your work. You have high expectations. So I'm saying manage those things first and you may Ah, find that your stress level greatly reduces because the root cause of your stress isn't always the antics of the couple. I see. Right. It's sometimes the dog wagging the tail. I mean, the tail wagging the dog. Yep. Instead of the dog wagging the tail, Mm -hmm. you get firm in your foundation about how you do your work. And you become confident that you're doing it with integrity and and values that will benefit children. Next thing you know, you're not as stressed as you were before, except for when the narcissist or their attorney, you know, tries to rip you a new one. And then you're like, all right, what am I doing this work for? And then you go take a walk on the beach and then you're good. (laughs) So. So how Am do I making I, sense then? Yeah, but I, it raises the question for me that then how do I know whether I'm being stressed because I have really difficult clients or that my process needs to change and then changing it, I will be less stressed. How do I know? Well, that requires some self-reflection and that really requires some practical look at your practice. You know, how yeah. much training have you gotten? How much supervision about this particular work? There's a lot of great therapists out there, but there's not a lot of therapists that do this work with a great process in mind. You cannot do this work with a basic family therapy. No, no. I mean, it's been proven that that fails. Right. So unless you know what the model should look like, and I wouldn't try to develop one on my own because there's many models. You and I do impact training, right? Where Mm -hmm. we can train professionals to understand how to have a model that actually works for them, works in your area, works with your group of judges that you might work with. There's a lot of variables that go into what your process should look like based on where you live and and what your target audience is and all of that stuff. So I don't know that, I think that it's kind of like explore first. Am I stressed because I'm a newbie or I am trying to do this like family therapy and it's not working? You know, we're here to say by experience that once you get a good process in place, it makes it more comfortable for you in your own skin to do this work. And that is 90% of the self-care piece. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's what you, it's not supposed to hurt this right. much. <laughs> so, okay. And then, then think of it and then it puts you on this level playing field. And then, you know, yeah, you're going to spike every once in a while when you have that crazy mm-hmm. parent, you know, call you out and try to make you feel like you're crazy. And, you know, why did you do that? And you're biased towards her, blah, blah, blah. And then you, you think, yes. am I, am I, oh, you know, and then you have to, maybe you do have to talk to a supervisor or something to go, okay, just, you know, validate me a little bit here. I think I'm doing the right thing. I think I'm not saying it takes away all stress, but I'm saying the first order of business is to really look at your process. Yeah. So that's on the professional end. Let's project that on to co-parents. Do you think it's the same concept? Definitely around lowering your expectations. I, you know, yeah, I think there would be a very close parallel because the measure of my peace is how I interact, how, no, how I let the other parent affect me. And if I'm having clear, as you say, policies or procedures of how I'm engaging and not engaging, then I will, there'll be proof in that if I'm doing it the right, the right way. Right. So it's one of the reasons we instituted the weekly email protocol. Yes. Because that gives you some structure. That gives you a way to say, okay, he or she may do it this way. They may harass me. They may send me 14 emails a day. They may call me, text me, hit me up on social media. There's uh, numerous ways for them to harass me, but this is how I'm going to approach communication. Yes. And when you do that, there's a sense of, okay, I know what I'm doing. And I know that what I'm doing is not violating any major co-parenting principle, right? Yeah. I'm still being a co-parent. I'm still communicating with my co-parent. I'm still giving my co-parent pertinent information. I'm still following the parenting plan as ordered. So there's absolutely no reason why this should be deemed as the wrong thing to do other than them telling me that. (laughs) Right. Yes. (laughs) Unless your parenting plan says you must talk to each other every day, and they rarely do, Mm -mm. right? Even when it's OFW is ordered. Mm -hmm. We know that that doesn't mean you have to talk to each other every day and answer all 14 emails. And, you know, so, so it's one of the reasons we do that is it provides the co-parent with a process that works and that gives them some peace, much like the professional who has a process. Yeah. And yeah, by yeah, working yeah. the process, it gives me some peace. And so, again, a co-parent who responds to all 14 emails every day, who answers every text, who jumps when the other parent says jump, and then I say, well, you need to take care of yourself. They're going to look at me and probably say a few choice words. <laughs> like, uh-huh. well, you have no idea what I'm going through. You're not dealing with this person. Right. And I would agree with that. But at the same time, I'm going to say, maybe you need to check your process. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So that, and that's just one piece of what we teach people, right? Mm -hmm. Another thing, and I think this is good for professionals and co-parents, but we talked about this recently in our hump day Wednesday group. Um, is that developing a values statement around your co-parenting and sticking to that much like it would be your mission statement is helpful. Uh, We've talked about how we've done this in our classes where you ask parents, what will your child say about you in 10 years as a Mm co-parent? What would you like to hear them say? Oh, I want to hear them say that, you know, they could always come to me. My mom always listened to me. My dad was always there for me. And we, they they come up with all these abstract ideas, what they hope their child will say child never, they don't care whether the child says, I'm glad my mom got two weeks in the summer in 2024. Right. Probably aren't going to say that in 10 years or good thing. You know, mom was in charge of the passport and dad wasn't or or else something bad would have, you know, right. Or whatever, whatever the thing is that you are in conflict about. So the mission statement should really follow that. If you want your child to say in 10 years that you were the parent who always listened to them, what does that mean you have to do right now? You have to be behaving in a way that will produce that that statement. Yep. 
So I think that's a good mission statement for how you interact with your children or mission way to develop a mission statement and objectives underneath your mission statement for how to approach your children. I think it's probably a good idea to do that with your co-parent relationship as well. Mm -hmm. You know, what is my ultimate goal with the co-parent relationship? I hope it's as simple as just execute the parenting plan with as least amount of conflict possible. If that's your goal to execute the parenting plan peacefully so that the kids don't get stuck in the middle or whatever it is, what are the objectives that go under that? What are the three things I'm going to commit to doing to stay out of conflict? I hope one of the three things is not answer every email, text, and phone call (laughs) that I get from the other parent. Right. That would not feed the mission statement. Now, some people may have a whole different mission statement. My goal is to destroy my co-parent. Well, yeah, okay. And I've their, met those. Yes. And their objectives are right on point. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to achieve that mission statement. Or yeah. some people is my goal is to get back at him for all the years of a horrible marriage. Mm-hmm. And if that's your goal, then you've probably got three really specific objectives that you're going to do (laughs) to exact revenge. Yep. So I would suggest that if you say that what I want is to execute the parenting plan peacefully, then you can't have the objectives of revenge underneath of that. Mm -mm. It won't, it won't feed your mission statement. And that's where people get, screwed up what they say they want and how they execute are two different things. Yeah. And a lot of times they, they, like you said, have wrong expectations about what we should be doing, right? We, we we're divorced, but we still need to be parenting together. And so when the other parent won't engage or parent the way I think they should, then I lose my peace because I'm trying to make the other parent do something I have no control over. Yeah. So that's a good point. You bring up the managing the expectations, just like we said with the professional, there are three different ways to achieve success. If your Mm -hmm. process is right. Mm -hmm. Same thing with co-parents. What would be the ways to achieve achieve success? Well, if you're the cooperative co-parent, And I've met some of these where they actually get along better after divorce than they did when they were together and they're double dating with their new spouses and having a grand old time. And we all like, you know, gag at the thought, (laughs) (laughs) at least our listeners do, but there is a certain percentage of people out there and you've met them and they almost boast about it. And you're like, oh, whatever. So let's say your expectation is to be like your neighbors down the street who get along so well and double date with their new spouse. (laughs) You are, you're going to be a ball of stress all the time. Yes. If that's the only expectation you have. So let's say you can't achieve that. What would the next best thing be, Rick? Uh, I would suggest the parallel style where you are each in your individual lane and those lanes don't connect. Yeah. And we know about 50%, if we were going to put it in loose statistics, because they change all the time and it's hard to, it's hard to determine this, but about 50% of people settle into parallel parenting pretty well. Mm -hmm. There's about 20 to 25% who do cooperative pretty well. Maybe 3% do the double dating thing, right? But top 20, 25 are probably doing cooperative. Say about 50% are doing a good job at parallel. And then there's that bottom 20 that struggle and are in conflict all the time. And those kids are really at risk, but think about the 50% and let's put them on a bell curve. That Mm -hmm. looks, that looks very, very different for different couples. Yeah. Parallel parenting is a good goal, but it's going to look different. Mm -hmm. So the definite, the loose definition would be parallel parenting helps parents achieve a good enough co-parent relationship. Good enough. I would say that puts the emotional and mental well-being of the children as the measure of good enough. Yes. And yeah. even though they may fail occasionally and don't always do it perfectly, and every once in a while they have little conflicts, the kids don't see you as being high conflict or the kids aren't af- 
afraid of what's happening next. The kids are pretty well adjusted within the relationship. Yeah, they're not impacted by your right. slip up or mistakes. So if, yeah. Right. So if you can't have the cooperative, the next goal would be then the parallel style, mm-hmm. which is what you would use the weekly email protocol for. Mm-hmm. That serves the parallel style that minimizes communication, that maximizes the child getting his or her need met, right? Yeah. So the cooperative style maximizes communication while minimizing conflict. Yes. Parallel style is minimizing communication while maximizing the The well-being of the the well-being of the children. Right. What we would call a conflict style, those bottom 20 to 30 percent. Right. Maximizes communication, maximizes conflict, minimizes the child's well-being. Right. So if you can't do cooperative, you've tried parallel, but the other person insists on keeping you in conflict, which is probably 90% of our listeners are dealing with that impossible parent. Can we define success in that for them? Is there, just like in the professionals, they said, well, you always go to court and you tattle on them. That's really not what parents want to hear. (laughs) No. You can't achieve parallel. I guess you're going to court. No No. one wants to hear that. No. So how can we help parents define success if they're dealing with an impossible parent? Well, I, we, how many episodes have we produced over the last three years? (laughs) We've been defining that all along the way. Um, But you're going to have to know your own limits. You're going to have to know whether your expectations are healthy or not, what to expect. Like for instance, I, when I outline a parallel model for two of my clients, uh, I often start with pretend that the other person is never, ever going to do the right thing. Then you have to come up with a plan B, you know, or another strategy to take care of yourself and to take care of the children's emotional and mental well-being. Yep. So that's often where I start. They could get better at this and maybe eventually be able to communicate more. But basically, you have to parent as a single person, and the other parent doesn't exist is mm-hmm. pretty much the best way to start out thinking about it. So I'm gonna oversimplify it. Okay. By saying, if you can't do cooperative, if parallel seems impossible because the other parent is always just trying to throw a monkey wrench into it and take you to court and keep you in conflict, the third piece, the the go-to, the default, is I'm just going to take care of my kids. Yes. You can define success. In the midst of a constant storm with the other parent, simply by saying, I can't control what they're doing, but I can focus on my relationship with my children and they can still be okay because of me. Yes. So if you can't do cooperative, you've tried parallel, but they're making it impossible. Now you're in that bottom 20% of where... (laughs) Their mission statement is to destroy you. (laughs) And you say, you know what? I'm just going to focus on my relationship with my children. I'm going to do everything I can to teach them values. But even so, the other parent begins to alienate your children from you. Then the only thing you can do is go to court. Yeah. That's the sadness of parental alienation is that. If you're not given the opportunity to work on your relationship with the child, you don't really have a choice but to let the court know the other parent is interfering yeah. with, with my relationship with my child. And that is a source of unbearable stress. Indeed. But you don't have to go there right away is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right? Right. If it's a progressive feel, right if you feel extra extra stressed every day all the time and you just finally call your attorney one day and say we need to take this guy to court well you can do that but i would suggest you go back up the ladder 
And check your processes. <laughs> check your processes. <laughs> right. Are you trying to work the parallel style? Yeah. It's just not successful. Have you tried to ignore everything they're doing and working on the relationship with the child? If you've done all of that, and now you don't even have the opportunity to have a relationship with your child because your children are now being alienated from you, then I would say, yes, you now need to go to court. Yep. So check those boxes first. And if you do, that's your real path to peace. That's your real path of self-care. And then the other little things, you know, every time my ex says something mean to me, it drains me again or causes me to self-doubt or I, you know, my low self-esteem gets lower. Okay. You may need to see a therapist. You may need to do some exercise, work on your diet, work on your sleep habit. You know, all those things we hear everybody say that we never do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I'm submitting that in these particular cases, there's a lot more underneath that can be done that can affect your sense of peace before you go right to this is hopeless. You know? Yep. That makes sense. It does. It's I had thought of it that way before. Yeah. So it makes sense. Now, it it sounds very descriptive of what I was doing uh, without thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why you're still doing it. Yeah. (laughs) You would have quit by now had you not had a good (laughs) process. Yes. You would be doing something way better than dealing with people's conflict. But right. Obviously, you're passionate about it, Rick. So I appreciate that. All right. I hope that was helpful to both our professional and parent listeners. And um, we look forward to talking more about it next week. Yes. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. The information contained in this podcast is generic. It must not be misconstrued as constituting legal or psychological advice. Decisions relevant to any specific individual, family system, or case require the direct evaluation of skilled, child-centered professionals.